Hi, I'm Terry Brock. Today, our world is being changed in a massive way by a concept called big data. Actually, what it comes down to is using information better for making better decisions by taking massive amounts of information, more than our little brains can grasp, and let computers crunch these and then making sense of them we can make better decisions in many different areas from, oh, say, I'm going to give examples of telecommunications, law enforcement, flights, retail, lots of different operations can do it. Medicine, making better decisions and saving lives because of it. And it's all really because of this thing called big data. You see, our world is changing dramatically. We know that. Anyone that's alive today goes, yeah, of course it is. We're seeing a lot going on. And a big part of this is the intersection of social media and big data. Right now, social media is giving us lots of information with the network effects, co-creation, interaction, and people all dealing with these things. And then on the other side, when you can look at analytics and the sharing, searching through to see what's happening. And you got to store it, you got to capture the data. All of these elements go into it. But what you can find out is, say, how is a company doing? How is a country doing? If many people start writing, gee, is anyone looking for uh, a new job? Or are they hiring over here. Certain kind of phrases that can be tracked on, say, Twitter can yield a huge amount of information about economic trends months and months before the traditional government way of collecting data. It's because now we're using new tools that let us know in real time what's going on. We talked about this in a book that my co-author Gina Carr and I wrote for McGraw-Hill. They came to us and asked us to put this together about using clout. It's a way for measuring how influence is measured on the internet. It really gives you the ability to measure on a 0 to 100 scale how effective someone really is in persuading others to take action. That 0 to 100 scale is something that's important. The higher you are on that, the more influence you have and the more goodies you can get. For instance, Chevrolet was using that to find people who are highly influential in two areas. Number one, the environment. and Number two, automobiles. And they were able to give highly influential people the use of a Chevy Volt for a long weekend and say, here, here you go, here are the keys, have a good time. And by the way, you don't have to say anything about it. You don't have to necessarily write good. If you want to write bad, that's your choice. We'd like you to write good, but it's up to you completely. And they gave it to them and they realized this is a better investment of their money. By crunching all of these numbers to find out who is more influential, it helped Chevrolet better target their advertising dollars. Good retail use of money. American Airlines doing it as well. They said, hey, if you've got a clout score of 55 or higher, we're going to help you out. We're going to view a day in our prestigious Admirals Club, and you don't even have to fly American that day. Really nice for those who are getting it, but really nice for American as well, because then American Airlines was able to find out, hey, are these people really influential, and are they the people we should deal with? We also see that it's used by hotels. For instance, a lot of hotels now are looking at your clout score when you check in. And if you have a clout score that's high enough, they go, oh, welcome to our hotel. We see that uh, you are here. We would like to upgrade you to a suite. Now, by the way, that clout score that you have is public knowledge if you have a Twitter account and you've chosen to let that be available. By default, it's available there. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you go to clout.com and connect the social media networks that you're working with with clout so that it can measure that very easily. Clout gives you the ability to get a lot done. But it goes even beyond that because, you see, it's really big data driven. Cloud is looking at over 12 billion data points a day to see who's doing what and who is doing this that influence is influenced by you. If you influence a lot of important people, that will inflect, uh, make a big impact on your cloud score as well. And when you get into these numbers, I mean, it starts boggling my mind a minute. Here's a chart that just kind of goes, whoa, wait a minute. You're probably familiar with like one byte or a kilobyte, megabytes, we've heard of those and use them a lot, gigabytes, terabytes, but it goes beyond that to petabytes exabytes, zettabytes, and yottabytes. Now, I put down there at the bottom, you can see only the government can figure this one out and imagine this one because uh, it is so big, it makes my little brain go like that. But it's a massive amount of information on what happened, what the temperature was, who did this, what the retail price was, all these different things, and it crunches it through with massive amounts of calculation to determine what's really going on. So as we look at it, a terabyte is really 
a huge amount of bytes and we get down to Yoda bytes. I can't even imagine this. 2 to the 80th bytes or 1024 zettabytes or 1,048,576 exabytes. Again, this is huge amounts of data that mere mortals, we can barely understand. I think you had to have a degree in mathematics calculus or really understand that kind of stuff or maybe work for the IRS. I don't know. They might understand it. But uh, either way, we've got a lot of numbers there. And what that means is business. Because when you look at what is big data, it's a matter of going past a gut feeling because we can easily get some uh, ideas that this is the way it's working and that's not true necessarily. Blink is the book that Malcolm Gladwell wrote a while back where he talks about this and going by our gut can be good if we season it over time, if we've had real world experiences. Often, though, we're wrong, as he mentioned in the book. With Warren G. Harding, people's gut said, hey, he'll be a great one, and he didn't turn out to be very good. Other times, we'll say, yeah, I know this person is good, and it's because we've had other experiences that help us to know what is right and what is wrong. And by putting those together, then we have a much better feel of what really should be. Data also helps us in other areas because when you look at what it is, it's really a massive amount of information from billions and trillions or even more data points that are showing us what's happening. In the aggregate, very powerful information and trends that are given to us. We can then make better predictions because we'll know more accurately here's what's going to happen. And I think the big data has a lot of other advantages as well. It's a combination as never before. We're seeing massive amounts of information that we can acquire that before just kind of went undetected. Now we've also got the analytics to make sense of it. It's a beautiful combination. The two coming together at the same time. And We've got the tools which are now more affordable. We see computing power getting cheaper and cheaper all the time and getting faster. That gives us a wonderful combination to stay up with it. And in predicting the future, we're able to do a lot more. I love this quote from Yogi Berra. It's hard making predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> Sounds like something that Yogi would say. Because right now, we find that the goal of using big data is to more accurately anticipate and predict the future based on immensely huge amounts of data points. That's kind of the way you can sum it up of what big data really is. We're making these predictions based on past trends and we've got so much data that it goes beyond just our traditional gut feeling and we know more of what really is happening and going on. Now you see, it's really not about the analytics though. You might think, oh gee, it's just a bunch of number crunching. No, it's not about analytics. It's really more about uh, many insights to better know what is happening and when it will happen. That's where we get the real power. It gives us the ability to see what's going on. I love this quote here. Big data doesn't and is not meant to provide just more reams of data. It's designed to get accurate information on what customers not only say they will do, but what their behavior actually has been. That's important. If you ever notice that, sometimes what is said is not quite exactly the same as what is done. <laughs> it also provides information on the even more important concerns of what they are likely to do in the future because we've seen the trends, we've seen what's happened, and we got a better idea now of what's going on. And here's how big data can really create uh, value for you. One, it makes the information transparent and usable. Secondly, it boosts performance by showing previously unknown important facts. Things that previously we didn't even know what they were talking about. Now we go, wow, look at that. And we found it out because of big data. Third, Hey, greater insights helps generate more precisely tailored goods and services. You know what people want. And then in a retail environment, for instance, you can customize it. We've seen this in automobiles where they grab what people want and build their own car. We've seen people building their own clothes based on certain specifications. Big data gives us the ability to be more profitable from, say, a retailer's point of view, and the consumer gets more of what he or she wants. And bottom line on that, the better decision making that we're getting from all of it. And it helps improvement for the next generation of products because now we're feeding that into the new product that we're designing to say, what should we put in there? What do people really want? Well, this is what they want. So we put that into the new versions. 
So how is big data being used? Now here's a few areas where it really is coming in a practical application. For instance, telecommunication, wonderful area. And with all uh, full disclosure, I was the past uh, editor-in-chief for AT&T's big blog called the Networking Exchange blog. I had about 100 geniuses, just wonderful people, reporting, uh, writing articles uh, about what's going on. And they were helping uh, put together a blog that then helped AT&T to sell more data. In the areas of cloud computing, mobility, social media, and a very important element of security. So we were writing about a lot of those and putting them together. And now in telecommunication, we see that there's increased demands on the networks as consumers demand more bandwidth, video services, and faster speeds. Constantly, they want more. And we see that the decisions made have been made manually or hard-coded into some kind of business support system that might not be right if we don't use the data that's available to us. But we see now what we really need is real-time insight to make decisions quickly based on what's going on right now. Not just a gut feeling, not just on some kind of hard-coded BSS, the business support systems. And we have a need for a greater customer experience and network efficiency to reduce the churn rate. See, if you can make those decisions rapidly and quickly, then customers are more likely to stay with you. When they have repeated problems, we see analytically the churn rate goes up. So this contributes to the bottom line in telecommunications. You need to know what to do with the analytics that are acquired already. Get those, understand what they can do, what we need to be aware of for them. This is really important, very important emphasis on that in the field of telecommunications. It's also being used in law enforcement within MyPD. Now, this is interesting. Listen to this. They found that by analyzing historical arrest patterns and then take that and cross-tabbing it with things that you think, this doesn't have anything to do with it, it did. Sporting events, rainfall, paydays, traffic flows, etc. They locate hot spots where traffic is more likely to increase for crime. We're seeing more crime in certain areas. And so what they do, they force deployment to prevent potential disruptions. They can put more police, say, uh, that are mounted on horseback in a given area at a given time when paydays are there, when the weather is this way. And sure enough, it not only reduces crime, but it's saving money and it's helping to give a much more safe and more assured environment for consumers. This only came about by tracking lots of data that before we didn't think was related at all. And talking about saving money, big data and airlines are doing this extensively to find flight arrival times. That's critical. And they used to use it only on the pilot's observation. Again, it was kind of a gut reaction or, as pilots used to say, flying by the seat of their pants. And any good pilot today knows that's not enough. They started using tech from PASUR Aerospace. It was a provider of decision support technologies in the aviation industry. They knew about this. They started really tracking it. And every 4.6 seconds, new info on weather, congestion, new radar, etc. Lots of data points were fed into the computer. What to do? And the bottom line, it virtually eliminated the gaps that meant that there was nothing going on when they could have made revenue and they wanted to make sure that it was obviously as safe as possible. Knowing when the plane will land will save millions of dollars each year because then airlines knowing where to deploy the ground crew to receive the plane, how to deploy uh, the apparatus, the gateways, the sky jets, those kind of things that are necessary and get set up down the road so that they have their connecting flights in order. By using big data, it leads to better decision, better predictions, and better predictions yield better decisions all the way around. So knowing what to do and how to do it really matters. Using big data to drive retail sales, very, very important. Sears Holdings wanted to generate value from data it generated for personalized promotions. They used this extensively. It took eight weeks to put together using the data warehouses. Then they used a technology called Hadoop. That's the one with the elephant and uh, started a while back. With big technology, they reduced the time, get this, from eight weeks to one week. Those in retail know this translates to bottom line dollars and really helps a lot. And they could be more precise and timely with implementation, implementation due to the data because they knew when it was coming through. The bottom line, we're getting data faster and that allowed them to implement faster. Better decisions 
and a lot more relevant on what consumers wanted, when they wanted it, and having it available in stock. Other applications we've seen, Kohl's and Walmart using big data to capture relationships between weather, pricing, packaging, the days of the week, the month, the positioning on shelves, and more. Just all this information that before we couldn't do it if we're trying to do it with just our little brains. But now with technology and with computers, they can crunch that. Google now searches on flu symptoms and treatments to predict the volumes for emergency room volume, to predict what those levels are actually going to be. We have historical data on that, and we know, okay, now we need a little bit more supply for emergency rooms or to prevent these types of events. Match.com and eHarmony, predicting better relationships with key variables. They know that people who like this, this, and this generally get along better. And if they have these matches, they get along better there. And hey, <laughs> that's really important for those that are single and looking for that right person. Medical applications, I think this is wonderful. Great opportunities here when we see what's available. For instance, they used the ENCODE project, which was a while back, back in 2012, and massive amounts of data were collected worldwide in several different centers. They are able to look at over 3,000, for instance, in this particular study, and then collaborated with many different teams of physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, a whole set of wonderful people in the medical community all of whom wanted to see better results and all of whom had limited insight for just their own data. But by sharing it in collaboration, we're able to get some massive amounts of uh, capabilities. Also on this and another, uh, they looked at 32 labs, 1,600 experiments, and more than 147 tissue samples to generate data for more discoveries. As big data expert Andy McAfee told my colleague Sarah Green in a recent interview, this is a quote from Eric Helwig, this is a real new arms race. You might not love it, and you might wish the world was predictable and calm and that Excel would get you through, but that would be a recipe for disaster. As Eric Helwig wrote in the Harvard Business Review, because you see, we have got to get our uh, minds wrapped around big data and understand what it can do and how we can best use it. Scientific research is now in overdrive. Data has long been the cornerstone of scientific discovery, and with big data and the big computing power necessary to process it, see, it takes both of them. You put those two together. Research can move at an exponentially fast clip. Take the Human Genome Project, widely considered to be one of the landmark scientific accomplishments in human history. Over the course of this $3 billion project, researchers analyzed and sequenced the roughly 25,000 genes that make up the human genome in 13 years. With today's modern methods of data collection and analysis, the same process can be completed in hours. Think about that. 13 years, now we can do it in hours, all by a device the size of a USB memory stick used for collecting data in less than $1,000. That is amazing. The possibilities are enormous. Amazon is using it, looking at a retail site. Amazon is using this in a big way to track the likes. We've all seen that. You know, on the side there, they've got products that we have uh, been interested in, we have purchased, or products that are like that. And if we opt into it, that's a key, opting in, then we know, hey, this is in our best interest to see what's happening. So when you look at what big data really is, well, it's not just more information. It's massive amounts, not petabytes and more. Like I was telling you about those Yoda bytes there at the beginning of this presentation. Yoda bytes of data which are analyzed to reveal previously hidden solutions. And new insights that were previously unavailable, now we can see it's like, wow, now we can see it because we've been able to crunch it and analyze it. These forces that are all coming together with affordable computing make it possible to do it. But keep in mind, we've got to use the human side as well. I love this quote here from Grady Booch. A fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs> so we've got to use our wisdom and our judgment on it. Don't just throw a bunch of computing power at this. We have to use the human idea. Now, there are also a lot of big concerns. We saw this come with the revelation that the National Security Agency was monitoring telephone calls and others from Americans to decide who they are, what they're doing, etc. But we're very concerned about this because of what happened. And we see that the big concerns and the cautions, uh, be cautious on over-automation. We've got to remember we're still human beings and that human touch is always important. Without that, we will be very upset.
Into that, we have to look at the target, sending baby coupons to a teenager who hadn't yet told her parents she was pregnant. This did happen and can cause a great deal of problems, as we all know. Flash crash on Thursday, May 6, 2010. Dow Jones plunged 1,000 points, about 9% on false information. So we have to be careful with big data and put the proper controls. But then that's like any technology that we've had throughout history. There's been advantages, and we had to use human judgment to make sure that it's safe for us. Other big data cautions are going to be their privacy. Always a concern, and that was accentuated with revelations that we saw from NSA, the National Security Agency. Also, government surveillance and NGO monitoring and surveillance. Others looking at what we're doing, we have to draw those boundaries. A big concern is to make sure that you have opted in, and it's not just something that is being done without our knowledge. Solution? Well, we exercise caution. That is the key. And take the steps for safety. These are critical. So how can companies and organizations comply and do now? What can they do regarding big data? Well, here are a few steps. One, focus on the possibilities. There are tremendous possibilities of gathering data that previously you didn't know about, but now can find out from a massive amount of variables, weather, data, colors, wind, temperature, other variables that are both related to and seemingly unrelated related to your industry. We can find out a lot. Get educated. Yep, we all need to go to school and learn about big data and what we can do with it. Continually study this fast-changing field. It's one that is rapidly changing, and we're going to see even more change going on. And instead of asking, how can we get far more value from far more data? Seems like a logical thing to do. Successful big data overseers seek to answer, and this is important, what value matters most and what marriage of data and algorithms gets us there? How do we do that? Michael Schrange talked about that in his article, What Executives Don't Understand About Big Data. This is very important that we follow that and we understand the value that we're going to get from it, more important. The most effective big data implementations are engineered from the desired business outcomes in rather than homogenous data sets out. Amazon's transformational recommendation engine reflect Bezos's focus on superior user experience. That's important. Rather than any innovation, emphasis on repurposing customer data. That's real business leadership, not petabytes in search of profit. Very important point. Big data, you see, is not about giving up thinking and relying only on raw data from machines. It's about using that data to create solutions for the experiences of customers, employees, and other stakeholders. Understand customers as people who use technology, like mobile devices, for frequent and regular requests. All of this data can and should be used only with the full understanding and the permission of those who can benefit from it. Big data is more than just collecting masses of information. It's about collecting relevant, that's the key, relevant data to better serve customers. So some advice for using big data. Watch out for looking at noise and interpreting it as a pattern. Watch out for recopying your own biases into data. That's something that we can all be guilty of. We've got to make sure that what we're looking at, we go, hey, this is my prejudice. Let me put that aside for a moment and look at the data as objectively as possible. Do you want the truth? Or do you simply want something that makes you feel better and comfortable? Smart business leaders know we have to sometimes painfully accept the truth and get rid of what is more comfortable that might not be accurate. The net of all this is hardly a cold quantitative world. Rather, as marketers and machine systems learn more about our attitudes and behaviors, they're likely to achieve greater intimacy, and this would be with consumers and customers than ever before. Yes, there is a risk of an Orwellian nightmare. Like we said, throughout history, there's always been problems. If the inferences from big data become too intimate and too intrusive and end up in the wrong hands, we will be in trouble. Ray, uh, Jeff uh, Rayport talked about this in Big Data to Predict Your Customers' Behaviors. Very, very important. There's also the opportunity to deliver services and marketing with unprecedented precision and accuracy, meeting and exceeding customer expectations at every turn, knowing the right time to deliver the right message or action in the right place before, key term, before the time has come, will bestow extraordinary power to those who wield such intelligence with intelligence. 
Yielding the intelligence with intelligence is most important. Use prediction wisely, and big data has the potential to make the world small again. That is every marketer's dream, getting closer to customers. That is what we want, and big data, when used properly, can give us that ability. So here's some action steps for you. One, begin the study. We get a chance to learn something brand new, and it's continuing to evolve very quickly. Second, a task force of IT, marketing, management, and other key stakeholders in decision-making would be very helpful. Not just one group. This is not just technology. This envelops the entire enterprise. Collect data pertinent to your business. That's the starting point, but remember, you also want to collect other data that might not seem to be important, and we find correlations with that as well. Select the tools for analysis based on real-world need. Not one size fits all because we know that one size does not fit all. And very important, rinse and repeat regularly. <laughs> Continue to refine and modify this. That's the key. You want to combine the analytics with the human intuition. Putting that combination together gives you a competitive advantage and helps you to serve customers better than we've ever been able to do before. If you have further questions, I would love to hear from you. My email address is terry at terrybrock.com. So just uh, drop me a note and I'd be happy to uh, help you where I can on that. terry at terrybrock.com. Thank you very much for joining me and I will look forward to hearing from you.